Mark Zawecki, you're of uh, 650 Labs. You're an innovation uh, specialist. What do you do? Thanks. We, uh, we help large companies around the world understand and react to disruptive innovation. And uh, disruptive uh, innovation, it's, uh, it sounds really good, but what does it mean? It's mean finding new growth in companies. Uh, companies are often built to do one thing and one thing well. We live in a world where the, the pace of change is, is increasing. We're on the back half of the chess board, and this change is coming at uh, very large companies quite fast now. And uh, they have to find new sources of revenue in the next decade to continue to grow. Yeah, and um, this, this disruptive uh, innovation and disruption is, is a word of the last couple of years. So is it a, is it a, um, is it a word, a technology-based uh, uh, word? Is the, is the digital wor uh, world, um, uh, does it force, us, force it upon us? Every, every industry is being digitized, every industry. And if you think of what digitization really is, Think of it as a, a layer of information on that industry that's being exploited by software and that's being exploited by business model innovation. And so we're seeing new companies come into markets um, where, where before they weren't present. So uh, a, a, um, a Rabobank may not need to think of an Abi and Amro as a competitor as much as they need to think about uh, something coming from underneath That, that, that now becomes becomes the the new competition. Um, what we mean by disruption is there's a, for instance, a, a, a startup. They know your name, your phone number, your email, and your date of birth, and they open a bank account for you. That's all they need, and yeah. you don't have to go to a to a, a branch to open a, a bank account, and it's immediate on your mobile phone. Yeah. Uh, you are uh, as someone who is busy all the time um, with uh, innovation and saying that the innovation is coming from new players. Uh, why do you focus on, uh, on the present players? What, what is it that you like about it? Well, I do believe they need help. And look, large companies have a lot going for them. They're full of smart people. They have a lot of resources. They often have a lot of history. They have a lot of distribution, a lot of ways to get to the market. But they tend to do traditional things. Uh, they, they jargon surf. <laughs> they, they hear a word and they latch on to it. Um, all big companies tell me they're innovative, and it says in their annual reports they're innovative. But the reality is that, that about 8% of large companies can grow by, by 5% a year per year. Mm -hmm. So 92% of large companies are not growing, but they say they're innovative. I think there's a, there's a disconnect that they're... They're using language. So we're really trying to help more large companies grow faster. How do you do that? How do you help them? We look at, uh, well, I'm, well, I'm based in Silicon Valley. I spend most of my time abroad. I spend most of my time with large multinationals, both in Europe and in, in, uh, in Asia. And we're seeing patterns of companies inside of Silicon Valley. If I look at Google, I look at Facebook, I look at Apple, I look at Twitter. These companies are practicing organizational characteristics that I don't see big companies practice. And, and again, back to jargon surfing, they, they think they understand how these companies work. They try, to, uh, they, they try to adopt some of the principles, but these companies, these disruptors are acting on a set of organizational principles that the large companies haven't yet adopted. So for instance, I see big companies do pilots. And we do pilots to, to basically reduce risk, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with pilots is they slow down learning. They elongate learning, right? They, they slow down learning and they take a year or 18 months. We have different phases of pilots and we have to have a steering committee and terms of reference and they're, they're very complex. And what I see these Silicon Valley disruptors doing is experiments. And experiments are kind of the opposite of pilots. They accelerate learning. And, and so, as an example, we teach large companies how to do experiments. Because failing often, failing fast, they've heard the jargon. But again, it's jargon to these big companies. They're not practicing uh, experiments like I see Google practicing experiments. And I would argue that 
that accelerated learning, which experiments do, is, is a much better competitive advantage than practicing pilots that slow down learning. But what is the, the uh, what is the biggest difference cause, um, be, be, between the pilot and, uh, and the experiment? Cause can't a pilot be an experiment? Or is it... Well, pilots, by, by, by their very definition, they, they delay learning. They slow down learning because we go through a process which is around reducing risk. How how can let me let me give you an example? How would you how would you design a new service that 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 tried to do broadband connectivity around the world using using air balloons, right? If if I wanted to to try to connect a broadband internet connection throughout the world, I'm going to use weather balloons floating up in the sky. Yeah, that's what Google. That's is. That's what uh, Google yeah. does with with their project Google Loon. That started as a series of very, very small experiments in one weekend. And one experiment cost 20 euros, and it was how high can the balloon go? And the next experiment that cost 20 euros says how far is it going to stay in the air? And the third experiment cost another 20 euros, and it, and it had to do with payload. And then the fourth experiment, this was an expensive one, it cost 40 euros because it was two balloons. It had to talk about the proximity and how those balloons communicated. They spent 100 euros in a weekend to prove a lot of quick ideas without ever doing a pilot. And a traditional company, I don't think ever would have, on a weekend, gone out and bought some weather balloons and, and played around that quickly. They would have had to have a meeting next month to decide if this is yeah. a project they should yeah. do or not and what's the potential business case. And they might have bought balloons in, in month nine. And how um, uh, uh, how do you look upon something like this, where big companies are organizing a hackathon, uh, having a couple of hundred people uh, making stuff? I really, really admire what's going on this weekend. And seven great Dutch companies, seven large companies got together and they realized a very important concept in innovation, and that is uh, this idea of open innovation, uh, directly says, all the smartest people don't work for us by definition, and maybe we should think outside the boundaries of our company to come up with ideas. That, that's the, 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 the direct definition of yeah. open innovation, right? And so all of these companies said, uh, we need to go outside the boundaries of our company to find ideas, and so the, for the seven companies that are here, I admire them tremendously. For the dozens of large Dutch companies not here, I, I think they're missing out. I think they're uh, they're not working this weekend, <laughs> and, and and they're not tapping into the external environment around them, which is which is vitally important for, for innovation in, in the in the environment we live in now. Yeah. So um, and why um, why is it important for companies to um, make their data set, make an API, make things available for? Uh, of course, you 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 set because another group of people, uh, smart guys, are starting to work with you. Um, have you examples of um, well that it worked for the good? I, look, there's yeah, there's lots and lots of examples of how uh, around the world how companies exposing APIs have delivered new value, new services for, uh, for, 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 for customers across a variety of, of sectors. It's, a, it's a, obviously a well-known uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, I see governments exposing uh, data around how their cities are working more efficiently, and there's all kinds of commercial applications that have set on top of that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it's, yeah, it's a well-known fact that exposing data APIs, APIs around your business can 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 accelerate yeah. new services. Yeah, but and at the same time, it's still difficult for a lot of companies to do it. So where's where's the, the where's the where's the difficulty? Well, the difficulty is this. Um, my my good friend John Hagel wrote a book, and 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 and, and his his book is um, this is the part you edit out. Um, it, John Hagel's book is this, this notion that we no longer control information in our organization, that, that, we, that we lived in a world of so-called knowledge stocks, and now we live in a world of knowledge flows, where we used to think our competitive advantage was having a secret and holding on to that secret, and that we'd be able to uh, manage our success. That was called strategy. 
But we now live in a world where knowledge flows become much more important, where we're getting our ideas out in the open environment and getting uh, companies and individuals to react to that is actually more of a competitive advantage than holding on to things tightly. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is the central concept of his book. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the book right now. Um, um, People will Google it. Yeah, yeah. So edit that, ed edit that bit out to talk. Another, another related concept to John's book is, uh, is this idea of the, the talent economy. 30 years ago, large companies, they basically, the world's largest companies, they basically competed on either natural resources, Shell's an oil company, or they competed on physical products. And, the, and, the, and the, th those were the basis of competition. But now we see uh, well over a third of large companies in the world are truly information-based. And the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, these are talent economy businesses that are just full of smart people that are, that are, that are competing on the basis of math and algorithms, yeah. and, and they're exporting that math and algorithms across and outside their, where they started, their core industry. Uh, Google delivers groceries in parts of, of, of California now. Google delivers yeah. groceries. Yeah. And we know they're working on autonomous cars, and we know they're working on, on uh, longevity. Google's Calico project, the California Life Company, is a healthcare play. And so it's extraordinarily important for companies to understand the assets they have around their data and accessing that via APIs because it's going to transform industries. Yeah, and it's the fascinating thing as well is because all those new upcoming uh, companies, uh, they are worth a, a fortune and they only work uh, a small amount of uh, people. For example, I think in the, the company that made Minecraft and it was now sold for it was two billion or two Correct. and a half billion. Yeah, my, uh, and and I think they work. 30 people. <laughs> Correct. And the same thing happens, of course, with the Airbnbs and the Ubers of, uh, of this world. So what can uh, uh, companies learn from that uh, uh, fact factor? The, they, they, can, they can learn an awful lot around data and algorithms and math becoming a competitive advantage. You know, these, as I said, these are our are, are talent economy companies you know, and I, as I said, one, one foot of mine every day is in Silicon Valley where I reside. I live in the same postcode as Google, but on the other hand, my clients are mainly in Europe. So the other foot is in Europe. And, you know, this word big data. Uh, big data means something inside of Silicon Valley very different than it means to large multinationals uh, in Europe that, I, that are my clients. Yeah. Um, let me explain it simply like a, like a spreadsheet. If... if if big data were a spreadsheet, all the big companies in the world are, talk to me about the rows, and they talk to me about the, the big, and so they think volume and data, so they think technical, but, but it's a rows argument they're making. And then I look at Silicon Valley, and, and it's a columns problem. They're more interested in the variables and the interrelationships of the data huh? and the algorithm that comes out to really, really understand how they can extract value in an industry. So when I go meet a big company, and they tell me they're all working on big data, of course. My follow-up question is, can I, can I meet the data scientists? What do you mean? I want to meet the team of PhDs in operations research, in mathematics, and computer science, and chaos theory, yeah. and it, all of the different weird and crazy disciplines. And I want to know how they're working on advancing your business. And of course, these people don't exist. Yeah. But of course, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Yahoos and the, and the Apples are full of these people. And, and so, so, so big data isn't a rows problem, it's a columns problem. And I see every large company in the world treating it as a rose problem, and I see every disruptor treating it as a as a columns problem. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And um, having uh, the the your foot in in two worlds in uh, in the Silicon Valley world and the European world. So, uh, so what other uh, differences do you see? Is is it a, a different in? Uh, how we work or how we always think uh, in America that's, that's where the ambition uh, is, that's where, where the possibilities are. So, 
it's a it's a it's a controversial point, but there's a lot of data to support it. And 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 maybe there's a maybe there's a certain ageism going on in Silicon Valley. Um, we know the stories of, of of Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and and uh, Michael Dell. They're 19 and they quit university and they've created a lot of shareholder value. Yeah. But when you look at world history, you actually discover that the under 35s for centuries have also come up with some pretty big ideas. That Charles Darwin was 28 when he came up with the theory of natural selection, and Albert Einstein was 26 in the theory of relativity, and Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the first self-propelled machine, basically a feat, basically a bicycle, he was uh, 23. And and uh, Louis Braille was 15 when he came up with the Braille, yeah. the blind reading yeah. system. Now, this is important because what I see are, are these disruptors these innovators, these Silicon Valley companies, consistently betting on the under 35s. And you read in TechCrunch, this 22-year-old got 20 million euros to go build something. You know, this is crazy. He's never run a, a newspaper stand, and now he has all this responsibility. Huh. And I think the lesson for big companies is these under 35s have a tremendous amount to contribute. And they're consistently being bet on inside of Silicon Valley. And yet, they're ghosts inside of large organizations. The large multinationals build pyramids, age-based pyramids. Mm -hmm. If you stay for 30 years, you get this little clock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and these under 35s, think about what these under 35, think about their traits and characteristics. They have something to prove. They have nothing to lose. They don't know what they don't know. They've been more recently uh, skilled. Uh, they tend to be single and have more discretionary effort. They tend to be living closer to the future. Uh, neuroscientists say your peak cognitive age is somewhere between 24 and 31. They're the, you're, you're mentally sharpest yeah. at this age. Uh, you tend to be more physically fit and just have more energy. Uh, there, there's a whole host of activities. Why Silicon Valley, why the so-called VCs or venture capitalists bet on these under 35s? And yet, in our age-based pyramids and large multinationals, they're, they're, they're still ghosts. Yeah. They're still unheard of. So. Uh, we find this uh, this difference striking. Is it going to be more and uh, more and more difficult for those companies to, if they would want it, say, uh, uh, to, to, to attract those people? Because it's so easy easy to start something because of technology sure, is sure, cheap and it's sure. easy to try something. So it's uh, in, in the past you needed those companies as well to prove something to get somewhere. You did. I I saw a recent research and I, I believe it was U.S. research. But it was something like 90% of people under 30 wanted to go to a startup. They wanted to be, they wanted to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. They didn't want to go work for a big brand. And, and we, we have, I think we have a coming crisis in attracting newer people to come join us, younger people to come join us in our organizations. They, you know, they want, they want a lot of things in their jobs that maybe these big companies uh, can no longer provide them. Hence this, this idea of open innovation. Hence the idea that these large, largely under 35 year olds that are participating this weekend at the Dutch Open Hackathon, yeah. you know, tend to exhibit those characteristics, which I think is a great thing. Yeah. Um, uh, will you be here tomorrow as well? Is it your, is it I will be. I'm a, I'm a grand jury member, so I, I get to the, the privilege and the honor of, uh, of judging some of this tomorrow. Okay, brilliant. Well, hopefully uh, we can see you uh, after that and uh, see if you're impressed with what uh, they've come up with. Yeah. So uh, thanks a lot for now. Sure. Thank you.